All right, so in this module, we're going to be thinking about James Baldwin's Sonny's Blues. As we get into it, we might return momentarily to our fundamental concepts about the importance of literature, about what it is that literature does, provides us with a window onto another individual and the aspirations and anxieties that are significant to their lives. And the value of that, well, there's potentially multiple values to that, but one of the prime values for that is that it potentially expands our cultural horizons, allows us to see different kinds of people, and as I think happens quite effectively in this story, helps us empathize with individuals who might normally fall beyond our daily, our daily horizon, our daily activities, our daily perceptions. So you might not be very likely to run into someone like Sonny in your daily life. In fact, you might be potentially quite dismissive of people that you would maybe associate with the kind of life that Sonny is living. But here's a text that does its best, I think, in a really earnest way to help us try to understand the conditions that have led Sonny, Sonny, excuse me, to the place he is in life. And so we'll talk about all that stuff that relates to the story, but we might just back up and just think about some, some hardware issues, some structural issues that are really important to the course at this point. So let's think about just where we are, okay? So we're a few modules into the class, and one of the things that's starting to happen is we now have a common context for discussion. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Common context here would refer to the fact that we all read the same stories. So we've read Everyday Use, we've read Uncle Ben's Choice, we've read What You Pawn, I Will Redeem, and now we've read Sonny's Blues. And while these stories are written by very different authors living in different times, we can start to use these stories to help ourselves understand these stories, to help ourselves understand them better through comparing and contrasting, talking about what works in one story, what maybe is more appealing about another story, that helps us get more specific in terms of our conversations about literature and in terms of our conversations about these particular stories. So that's a really valuable thing to recognize. We might also just pause for a few moments here too before we kind of jump with both feet into this lecture and think about the issue of length. Okay, Sonny's Blues is the longest piece I've had you read so far. It is one of the longer short stories that you'll read in the course. And we need to always be thinking about how it is we're actually going to approach the story and go through the physical process of reading the story. So it is probably going to be the case, it is likely going to be the case, that this is a story you will need to read um, with a couple sessions. It may not be the case. You might sit down, read it, and find yourself pulled all the way through the text. It's a very interesting and very engaging text. But in terms of management, you may find it longer than things you've read before. So again, we want to stress here from the beginning the importance of approaching all of these stories as you would any homework assignment. And I've mentioned that in multiple videos by this point, and it's just because it's so important to your success in the course to approach it the same way. Not as you're getting ready to go to sleep at night, not you know in a position where you're relaxing in a hammock somewhere, but you know, in a formal learning position, um, at a desk, however you do it, uh, ready to take notes, to annotate heavily. Again, I don't just uh, talk about doing it. I also do it myself, okay? Every time I read the story, something different gets my, different gets my attention. We want to make sure that we're doing that. So that's, that's really important. So let's think a little bit about what this story is like, okay? So in Sonny's Blues, we have this really interesting reflection uh, where we have essentially one brother thinking about, among other things, his, his, his brother Sonny and what his responsibilities are kind of to and for his brother and also his efforts to help his brother, when possible, get through a very difficult period in his life we also get Sonny's comments on what he's tried to do to connect with his brother. But at the basis of the story, what we have is two people, even though they grew up in the same house, even though they have the same parents, who understand each other very, very poorly. Okay, And I think that is a great place for us to start talking about this story because brothers and sisters are probably uh, uh, subjects that many of you um, can kind of readily associate with. Um, what is it like to have a brother? What is it like to have a sister? And in particular, what is it like to have a brother or sister that you don't see eye to eye um, with on significant issues? Um, what is it like to find yourself in disagreement 
with that person. And this story does a really good job of showing us two brothers who have a very hard time uh, reconciling with each other. In fact, it's not really until we get to the end of the story, I think, that our narrator gets a good sense of what it is Sonny's trying to do and how it is Sonny's trying to find his place in the world. So that fundamental question of brothers and sisters, if we think about where we've been in the course, we might recognize that we have encountered this before, and that can give us a little bit of comfort, right? We can look back to everyday use, and we can ask ourselves, well, if I think about the brothers in, in Sonny's Blues, how are these brothers uh, similar to or dissimilar from Maggie and D in everyday use. Well, everyday use is a radically different scenario. Uh, we don't see Maggie and D communicating with each other on anything like the same level that we see in Sunny's Blues, right? Because in everyday use, we have this intervening figure of the mother. She's literally the narrator of the story. And so that and so all the interactions between the sisters in those stories, in that story, excuse me, they're all kind of filtered through her, right? So everything that we see about Dee or Maggie and the potential complications these sisters have, it's all filtered through her. We also get the sense that Dee and Maggie have had dramatically different lives. Which is interesting because when we look at Sonny's Blues, we see again two brothers who appear to have had dramatically different lives. Right, Our narrator is a high school algebra teacher, uh, teaches math, has a job as a teacher. Sonny's had a very different career in and out of the military, um, in and out of you know uh, situations uh, that weren't very helpful to him, uh, in and out of jail. All of these things that have led him to where he currently is in life. Our narrator has a family. Sonny doesn't have a family. Our narrator has gone through the, the, the tragedy of having a child die at a young age. Sonny has not gone through these things. So again, they're very, very different lives. But these are individuals who, despite their differences, at numerous points in the story, are trying to connect with each other. Okay, are trying to come back together and associate with each other. And that's really not what's going on in everyday use. That doesn't seem to be a major concern for Maggie and D. So we might set them up that way. There are some similarities. Um, you know, families uh, kind of living in a uh, impoverished situation, minority families in both stories dealing with uh, social discrimination, some of which is suggested in the text, some of which we have to simply infer from the environment. Um, but we have a key difference between the two and the key difference, or one of the key differences besides gender and age and those kinds of things, is the sense that here we have two brothers who are repeatedly coming back together trying to figure out how they connect. And that doesn't seem to be the case with Maggie and Dee. In fact, it happens so often in this story, we might start to discuss the concept of theme. Okay, we haven't talked much about theme so far in this class, primarily because the stories that we've read have been so short that it's been hard to see themes, uh, it's been hard to see recurrent ideas in the story. We can start to get some sense of what a theme might be or how it might relate to Sonny's Blues if we take a moment and we think again about uh, what you pawn, I will redeem. In that story, right, we have this repeated act on the part of Jackson Jackson of receiving money and spending money receiving and spending. It happens almost constantly, and it generally happens, although not always, but it generally happens in his effort to try to build something like community. So we see him trying to establish community, trying to help somebody out by giving them some money. We see that again and again and again, and it becomes one of the major concepts in the story and is particularly significant to the end when he takes the little money that he has and he's able to exchange it for something wonderful, something that connects him finally to a very significant sense of community, by which I mean that the regalia that he's wearing and his memories of his grandmother that he's been referencing again for much of the, the story as well. When we think about Sonny's Blues, there are, there are other themes. We think of a theme as, as a significant idea that's repeated throughout the text. Okay, A significant idea that's repeated, it could be dramatized, it could be directly referenced. But as we go through Sonny's Blues, one of the things you might notice is how many conversations there are between the brothers, again and again and again. And in all of these conversations, the fundamental idea is that our narrator is not capable of understanding what it is 
Sonny is trying to say, what he's trying to communicate. And these breakdowns in communication lead to all kinds of problems, right? It leads to Sonny leaving, it leads to years of silence, it leads to a great deal of difficulty as they try to move back into each other's orbits and become a significant part of each other's lives. But it's this fundamental theme of brotherhood and the struggles of maintaining brotherhood as people go on and live different lives that's so so important and so significant to this story right so we know that's important we also know though and this is again significant to every other story we've read that we're only getting one side of this story or we're getting a real particular side of this story because everything that we get in this story is filtered through our narrator and he begins with a certain point of view he begins with certain expectations and as we go through the story we know that he has a really interesting personality okay um, a number of things have happened to this individual to give him a very kind of um, dark and upset relationship with the world uh, which we can certainly understand I hope when you're understanding the struggles of what it would be like to grow up as a young black man in Harlem in the 1930s and the 1940s and the 1950s uh, the significant social challenges that would be bearing on this family as illustrated so well with the mother's story of the father and the murder of his brother by the white men who took kind of a joy in crushing him in the street in their pickup truck uh, this is a world that is definitely um, upsetting uh, for our narrator. How do we know that? Well, we have that story very early on, that image of him imagining himself sitting in the room with the adults, right? And he's aware that the adults are discussing the darkness outside the room, and he's aware that the adults are going to move towards the darkness outside the room, and he's aware that once they move out into the darkness, eventually he will need to move out into the darkness. So there's this grim foreboding that kind of hangs over his life. And that's not necessarily what we see in, let's say, everyday use, where Mama, who's very aware of the, you know, the, 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 the significant challenges that racism posed to her, in her life in the rural south but she has a, a very safe space right she has her house she cleans her yard it's very rustic it's very rural but it is her space she is secure in it she knows what it's like to lose that security the old house burned down but she does have a secure space to be in that's not something jackson jackson has He's homeless. He tells us he's been homeless for a very long time. There really is no safe space for him to be in. Um, but his response seems to be not so much to focus on the grimness of the situation, but to focus on hope or to focus on the positive things in his scenario. And we could discuss that in a number of different ways. It may be that he's traumatized. It may be that he's incapable of understanding how bad things are for him. But we've maybe talked enough about what Dupont I will redeem. So I'll hold that off for a moment because Sonny's Blues is the focus of this, of, this, of this lecture. But one of the things we need to understand is that when an author, you know, does something again and again and again, there's, that should be something that should get our attention. There's a reason for it. So why is Baldwin dramatizing repeatedly these conversations between these brothers. Well, it's probably because the conversations are how these brothers get to learn about each other. They're how the brothers get to know each other. They're how the brothers get to respect each other uh, for most of the text. And then at the end, the ultimate association comes through music. Okay, so we might think a little bit about that. These conversations are important. They're repeated. Music is also important, and music is repeated. For example, very early on in the story, if you contrast this, what happens with the end of the story, uh, Sonny goes to live with um, Isabel's parents, right, or Isabel's family. And the problem there is that they don't like his music, and they find it um, hard to understand, and they don't like him playing the piano at all hours of the day, and it essentially estranges him from that family that he has to live with, which isn't his real family anyway. And it's not till the end of the story that music, you know, through the, the playing at the club with Creole leading, uh, leading the, the, the musical beats, that our two main characters find themselves reconciled. That's really interesting. I think, in terms of our fundamental understanding of literature right now, as we begin to expand upon what we've read so far with this new concept of theme, 
with this new concept that in literature we will find authors who will repeat key ideas, key concerns, key notions, particular events over and over again. And the reason for that is because they want to underline the significance of that idea to the story. Brothers, just conceptually, are important to this story. If we think about what's going on with the story of the father and the murder of his brother and how that essentially kind of deranges him for the rest of his life, makes him deeply unhappy. Um, his wife reports that she would see him cry many times, presumably because of his inability to, his very rational inability to reconcile what was done to his brother with the world that he lives in. He never knows if the white people he's encountering, the white men he's encountering, you know, may have been in that pickup truck or not that ran down the brother. As we go through the story, though, one of the things that we need to start to think a little bit about, because this is also going to be significant to, well, it's been significant to a lot of the stories we've already read, um, but it will continue to be significant to many of the stories we'll look at in the future, is this idea that it's very often the case in literature, in short stories, what we are experiencing, what we are viewing, is not just life as it's lived by other people, but we're viewing them change. We're viewing somebody undergo a transformation. And we can learn from that transformation. For example, in everyday use, we are clearly seeing Mama's transformation from her relation, in terms of her relationship with D at the beginning of the story to her relationship with D at the end of the story, right? At the beginning of the story, she's essentially estranged from D, but she's essentially um, a, a comfortable letting D simply walk all over her, right? So D can speak down to her, can read to her, can indicate that her house and her home aren't that worthwhile, are rustic, are simple, are are not in and of themselves, it's not in a significant place by itself. But by the end of the story, what we see is Mama stand up to D and pull right the, uh, the quilts from her and give them to Maggie quite forcibly uh, because she's making a stand for the place that she lives in and the things that she has and the value that she puts in those items and also in her other daughter. So we see that transformation, right? In What You Pawn, I Will Redeem, we see a really interesting journey that Jackson Jackson goes on. Is, is, is it the case that he changes? I, I think that's debatable, but one of the things we, we witness as we watch him go through that day, that 24-hour period, is we get to learn what kind of guy Jackson Jackson is. And the kind of guy Jackson Jackson is seems to be pretty great. And it's not a view we would get of him. It's not an understanding we would have of him if we just focused on any one of those hours or any two of those hours. It's when we take all the hours together and line them up and we understand, wow, this is a really interesting person who's done something really wonderful and the situation is tragic. And it's because I have that view of him over time, ah, I see who he is. I understand the significance of this story. When we get into Sonny's Blues, um, we see over a number of conversations, both with the brother and also with other characters that feature along the way, you know, who it is our narrator is and how it is he's changed over time. Uh, from the initial revelation of his brother being picked up for heroin and the anger and the rage and the frustration that he feels to the concluding moment when he's listening to his brother and he understands that his brother has found his purpose, has found something he can take some pride in, has found a reasonable, worthwhile goal for himself and can endorse that goal, right? And can say, this is indeed what he's been aiming for. I didn't understand it. Now I understand who my brother is and I have a better chance of being connected with him. Okay, that's a massive transformation. So we might layer that understanding on top of the other things we've already considered this term. So yes, literature does show us lives as it is lived by other people. It does broaden by that our uh, cultural horizon. It increases our cultural capital. A number of you really like that phrase, uh, or at least it got your attention in the earlier discussion posts. But all of that requires, or, or a great deal of that requires, our ability to recognize you know, what we're being shown and to think about why it is we're being shown it 
And in Sonny's Blues, all of this information, there's a long story, but all this information works together to show us how this narrator changes over time, right? How does he become better associated with his brother? Now, it also does the same thing for Sonny, because we clearly see Sonny change from an angry young man to a young man who tries to run away from his problems to a young man who confronts those problems and finds his purpose in his community. We see those changes as well. What I would, what I would throw out though at the end or throw in at the end is just this idea that we view that transformation from the perspective of the brother. So we always need to ask ourselves that fundamental question, am I in agreement with the narrator's observations? And I think that's a great place to start with a long story like this. As you're reading through it, as you're thinking about discussing it, one of the things you might wonder is, you know, do you find yourself in agreement with our narrator's observations, with our narrator's claims, with our narrator's basic attitude? Um, like, for example, it, it is curious how small of a feature the uh, young dead daughter is in the story, right? So we know this young daughter who has polio, she dies very horribly from it, um, and she dies young. Um, but she's referenced only at a couple moments. And the question we might have in the back of our mind is, how significant is her death to everything else that happens in this story? Is it significant to other things that happen in this story? Is perhaps our narrator's journey to reconciling with his brother, is it in some ways you know, compelled by the death of the daughter? Would be one question to consider. Um, so we might think about that. So again, it's a longer work. It demands more of us in terms of time and focus, but we have some tools to understand it. And those tools come from our common context, which in this class are the stories you've read so far. So I hope you enjoy it, and I look forward to hearing what it is you have to say about it.